The scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 28 through 35. Listen for the word of God. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we might not so that we may see and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate man in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God that is which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, he said to them, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Thanks be to God. Food is such an emphasis in our lives. I hesitate to say that some of you right now, this very moment, are probably thinking about what desserts are over on that table. It's a dangerous statement. TV, newspaper, internet abound with things related to food. There are a few quotes, two of them specifically, that relate to food that I'd like to offer you. The first one is, a messy kitchen is a happy kitchen, and my kitchen is delirious. <laughs> the second one is this, my next house, we're not gonna have a kitchen, we're just gonna have vending machines because of our tendency to go through and eat fast food. There are many ways that we actively go about being fed by other things, to try and reach satisfaction, to have some sense that we're doing something important. We eat the bread of work or volunteering, and that feeds us, does it not? We eat the bread of family and friends, and that feeds our very souls. We eat the bread of fun, and that feeds us. That's why we blew bubbles. In today's gospel, John 6, 28 through 35, the point is made that really, we can only be fed by the best, Jesus Christ. That is where we will focus today. In verse 35, Jesus says that he is the bread of life, and whoever comes to him will never hunger, and whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. You know people, perhaps someone sitting here who've had a transplant. Can you imagine how it would be to have somebody else's kidney inside you? It gives you life. It seems like a reasonable analogy to me to think about that in terms of Christ being in us. No matter what happens, good times, bad times, difficult times, and you all have them. Christ is in us. So the question is, how do we get fed by Christ as the main meal? First, and sometimes I forget, we need to remember that Christ is always in us and always with us. No matter what, times that are tough, times that are blessing, Christ is always here. Secondly, I think we need to be clear about what feeds us. To do that, I think we need to be clear about what belongs on our plate that we might consume and what belongs in the trash can. Here are some examples, but I invite you to think of your own. What belongs on our plate, the meal that Christ will feed us, is that every time we leave someone, we should leave in love. I typically say to couples who are getting married, don't go to bed angry. Don't go to bed angry. If it means you don't go to bed, <laughs> it means you're working on something. Don't go to bed angry. Always leave others in love. Another example, that we take risks with those with whom our spirits connect. 
even when we're afraid. There are people in your life that you know they need a little extra touch. They need a cookie. They need a call. They need a friendly hello. That's a way to make sure that the food that is on your plate is there because Christ feeds you. This church is very committed and has been to social justice. Many of you have done things for social justice and continue to, those, to do those things that are amazing. The Bible doesn't say it is your job to take care of those who can't take care of your, themselves. On the other hand, it really does say that. Even in the Hebrew version, widows were taken care of. It is our job to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. For many of us, those are young children, those are elderly, those are people who are mentally ill. Let your list go on. It is our job to do that. And those kind of things and the energy to do that belong on our plate, not in the trash can. There are denominations which believe that divorce is wrong. Not true of our church. And I believe that theologically that's grounded in the reality that God wants us to be loved. And if a relationship is not loving, it is time to cease. Doesn't mean without trying, doesn't mean going the sec not going the second mile, but there are relationships that don't make sense. Always praying for the other persons, but sometimes we just need to leave. As you receive your new pastor, be assured that like myself, he will do things that you may not care for. What belongs on your plate is grace and excitement and gratitude that Wallace and his family are coming. I was the guest preacher at a church after they had dismissed their interim. And I said, please tell me what this is about. This is a true statement. We didn't like the way the kids behaved, and we didn't like that his car was not clean on Sundays. This is with, in 45 minutes of where we are. Give Wallace and his family grace. He will come to love you, and you will come to love him and his family. Grace belongs on our plate. Those are examples that we need to decide what belongs on our plate. The plate with which Christ feeds us and what belongs in the trash. Here's a third guideline. We need to seek to be fed by Christ's love. Many of us love potlucks, correct? Now I grew up in a tradition in which I thought potlucks were another sacrament because it seemed like we were always having potlucks. And I really was so eager for church to be over so we could eat. But I wasn't hungry. I was a little bit hungry for the ham balls and the chocolate pie, I will admit that. Not so hungry for the tuna casserole, but if you brought a tuna casserole today, bless you. <laughs> what I was hungry for was to be fed by Christ's love. Many of you, as you think about your childhood, may have had similar experiences. There were people who hugged me. There were people who held my hand to go through the line even when I wanted to butt in and get another brownie. There were people who let me sit on their lap. This was obviously years ago. <laughs> but I remember that, how loved I was as a child. And I hope you do too. That is one of the ways that we seek to be filled by the food, really, by the love of Christ. And then here's another example. We need to see the evidence. We need to witness. There are several stories that are very striking to me. You have heard some of them during the time I've been blessed to be with you. There are two that I think are stories that are like updated contemporary versions of what the Bible says. Once a time, once upon a time, there were two brothers. 
And they always stole. And they always told, stole sheep. So the village got together and decided what they were going to do was to put an S and a T on the foreheads of both brothers to stand for sheep feet. And one brother was very embarrassed by that. So he took off, never to be seen again. The other brother stayed in that village and tried to do everything right. Tried to be kind, tried to help those who cannot help themselves, and became enormously loved. One day, a visitor came to that community, was sitting down at Starbucks or someplace, having coffee, and noticed that the brother with ST still in town was just across the road. And the traveler noticed Lots of people stopped and said hi to him. Hugged him, little kids would stop by and say hi. And the traveler was very impressed. What happened that everyone seemed to love this guy? And so the traveler asked someone at Starbucks, what's the story with that man? And the guy he asked said, well, I don't really know the whole story. That, as long as I've known him, that guy's had that little ST on his forehead. And the traveler says, well, what does it stand for? The man who was the local said, I really don't know. But for me, and for everybody in this community, it stands for saint. We are saints, my friends. We are called to be fed by Christ and to be God's hands. That's what the scripture tells us today. And then a second story which you may recall is from Robert Coleman in the book, Written in Blood. The story is that a little boy and a little sister were ill with some disease. And the little boy had recovered and then the little sister got worse. And so the doctor went to the little boy and said, your sister's pretty ill, would you give her some blood? And the little boy started shaking and trembling a little bit and finally he said, well, yes. So in those days, very differently than we would do today, they wheeled these two little kids into the room and basically piped blood directly from the little boy and the little girl. And the medical staff around noticed that the boy was still kind of trembling and shaking. And the doctor said, are you doing okay? Do you have any questions? And the little boy said, in a quavering voice, Doc, when is it that I will die? That little guy thought that giving blood to his sister meant that he would lose his life. Christ gave his life for us so that we can have fun, we can be the hands and the feet of God, that we can be fed constantly, not just in communion, but all the time by all that God has created. I invite you to remember that Christ feeds us. We can make choices in which we become more saint-like, more Christ-like. That we can really seek those opportunities. And this church has done that well and consistently for 167 years. Now it's up to you. And you are all witnesses to God's love. For that, we give thanks and praise and feel blessed. Amen.